Really? She's like, oh, Russ is teaching. She thought Sue was, so she was going to stay. <laughs> as soon as she found out Sue wasn't teaching, she's like, I'm out here. Anyway. All right, well, so how are things? How's everyone been since uh, we haven't seen you for a while? How are the holidays? How was yours? Mine was great. I didn't do anything wrong. I just hung out. <laughs> Any uh, any exciting business happen? Yeah, Carl? Yeah, I uh, made an offer yesterday that I think we're waiting for a pre-approval letter from upstairs. And out, it looks like it's going to be accepted. So. Awesome. Okay, well, good. So actually, on your question on the earnest money, yeah, you don't until it's accepted, you don't turn it in anyway. So. Oh, really? Until the offer's accepted, you're going to hold on to that. So oh, okay. I was think I was assuming your offer had been accepted, but if it's not, not, not accepted yet, yet. yeah, so then, like will good, but, so you hold on to it until it's accepted, then okay. you know you get to turn it into All right. So, perfect. Good. All right. What's up? We, we had a $23,000 loan appraisal. Wow. Yeah. Just going to put it together. Nice. Good job. We bought it. And the appraiser said, no, nah, I don't like the comps. Mm, I'm not budging one penny. So my seller, I mean, my buyer came up 11000 and the sellers came down 11000 uh, In awesome. today's market, they really, I don't know. Yeah. After showing that many homes, I was so glad. You were glad they did. Yes. <laughs> Good. Awesome. Anyone else? Any business happening? Yeah, I've got three new listings coming up this month. Awesome. So far. Woo -woo. Congratulations. Yeah. Doing great. Awesome. All right. Well, Jeff, our, who's coming up? I'll just have a, no, you go, Jeff. You right. go. I'll just Good. say a little. Which, Jeff's actually, are you teaching on Thursday? Uh, or, well, Citywide. Somebody from yeah. Citywide is. Yeah, you had, yes. <laughs> um, I heard so, you saying. Are you doing next Thursday or next Thursday? Next Thursday. Next Thursday. Okay. Week. I'll twelfth. try not to dull them to sleep, <laughs> so that you can have a good audience. I was interested to hear you about your appraisal issue. That's we had about twenty-five percent of uh, properties last year that were well, the, the last half of last year that were low. So be prepared because we go forward when you're in a, when your market going like this and we have bidding for properties, and amazingly we're still bidding on properties. When that happens, you're going to have issues with your appraisers. Your appraisers are very scared, they're very conservative, and they're going to try and bring it in low. Um, certainly, if you do your CMA on beforehand, um, it helps to get that in front of your appraiser. So um, just know that we can't talk to the appraiser, and you're not supposed to either, but on the front end, we're not supposed to direct them. But by all means, argue for your cost. Because it didn't work for you in this case, but in a lot of cases, we do find that the appraisers will make adjustments. Well, the last one I had, it came in low, and, I, and we did argue that, that it was such a small amount that the appraiser thought, okay, well, they're de yeah. decent comps, we'll, we'll go with it. Well, margin of error obviously helps when you're $25,000 apart. That's not a good margin well, of error. So. But, but be prepared for that to continue throughout this year because we're still seeing, even in the slowdown that we've had over the last month with interest rates climbing a little bit in the, the holidays, I'm still hearing about bidding on properties. So be prepared for that. Um, a little bit of news, we just pulled this up this morning. If I look, you can't really see this other than the fact you can see a trend right here is the election where we bottomed out. The bonds are increasing, which means rates go down. So we're seeing some improvement in the market. It's a really good thing. We would love to see the market to improve a little bit. Not to, I mean, I think we're going to see interest rates climb over the next year, two years. But let's do it gradually. That's the way the market will. That's the way we'll be able to adjust to the growing uh, interest rates is to have it happen more gradually than it has over the last month and a half. So anyway, that's good news. We're seeing some positive stuff there. What's the net change from January 1st to December 31st? Of last year? Yeah. It, okay, I'm going to have to guess because we were in, if I remember right a year ago, we were we were dealing in the mid threes and boy, at the end of the end of the year, we were seeing some stuff in the mid fours. So depending on your program, depending on your FICO scores, we probably saw almost a full percent in one year. So yeah, good good question. Um, that's, that affects people's buying powers quite a bit. So uh, obviously, we talked about this many times, silver lining is people cannot be fence-sitting. Get out there and buy that house. 
I just don't think that we're going to see, even though we'll see, we'll see temporary slowdowns because of interest rates and stuff, it's a robust market. We are in such an incredible place to buy a home. We're landlocked. They're not going to build any more land. And it's gonna, this is an amazing place to do real estate. It really is. Rents are up now, too. Rents are up, too. Really? Going up, so. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> so use that to your benefit. Any questions? Any concerns? Mortgage is going okay? Sean smiles. <laughs> He's a veteran pro. He goes, no. Nah, I I this year is going to be awesome. It so is going to be great. It really is. Do you know if Crystal's in this morning? I don't. I don't. I've tried to uh, get in touch with her, but I haven't heard the answer yet. And um, I need her big time today. Yeah, I don't know. I need know. Ken. Is he in? Ken's in. Absolutely. Good. Yeah. Ken well, is Steve. <laughs> and How Jeremy. Wait. We're all here. I'm here. <laughs> Jeff, sir. Yeah, so anyway, any more questions? This is going to be a wonderful year, really is. Hope you set your goals high, because this is, um, the opportunities are tremendous. Yeah, good, okay. We'll awesome. be here Thursday. Okay. I'll bore the, you to tears for two hours. Well, that ought to get them. We might even get out here less than two hours. <laughs> <laughs> what is All right, see you Thursday. Come on, Thursday. We'll Wait, you said Thursday? Full mortgage training class. Yeah. And it's the same time next week, right? Yeah. Okay, I have it on my calendar, but I haven't. Well, two, so apparently I was going to be my own. <laughs> Um, so I'm Sue, I'm with Vanguard Title, and we're up on the fourth floor, so if you have any questions, you can just pop on up there anytime. Um, I was thinking about just a quick tip for you guys today, and I was thinking that I think one of the greatest things you could start out with is learning how to set proper expectations for your clients. That's one of the things we run into a lot with new agents is that they there's sometimes some confusion on when keys actually transfer, and because of that, they'll set improper expectations with their clients and then that's always you know a source of frustration for somebody when people are you know excited to move and then all of a sudden you're like oh you're actually not getting the keys so I just wanted to go over that which is part of what I go over next week too but I'll give you the quick version so and because Utah is one of the few states that allow two different title companies it's important to remember that because that is one of the things that comes into play a lot of the times when there is a delay so you have your seller and your buyer and we're just going to say that they're both at different title companies. So the seller signs and the buyer signs, and now you have a lender involved. And so this is an important question because a lot of times they'll ask us, but really it's up to the lender. Like, when will the lender fund the money? Are they going to do it the same day? Do they have to have all the documents back? If they sign in the afternoon, are we not going to have the money till the morning? Like, these are a lot of important questions to ask. And so t typically when you're signing somebody, an expectation wouldn't be that it's not going to fund and record until the next day. So that's what would be standard. If something different, sometimes we can sign early in the morning and everything can happen in the same day, but that's something that you really want to be sure of before you set that expectation because that's where people get disappointed is they'll sign on a Friday and think, oh, I'm going to have the weekend to move in, and then they don't. So the buyer signs and then the seller signs, the lender sends the money, and then if the buyer has any money to bring in, they bring that too. So now what happens is all of this money has to get sent over here to the seller's title company. And so the wire cutoff time is 3.30, so if you sign after that or if they send their money after that, any of those things will delay this money going over here. And so once they have this money, then they can record the warranty deed, and that's really, that's really the big thing, is once that warranty deed is recorded, which they won't do until they have all the money, that's when the house is legally transferred over to the new buyer, that's when you can transfer keys. So a lot of times people think it's when they sign or when they have the money or when the money's at the seller's title company, but really it all comes down to that warranty deed. Once they have the warranty deed recorded, then you can do keys. And that's also, it's important to know, that's when the seller can get, if the seller has money back, getting money back, that's when they'll get it. So when the warranty deed's recorded, that's when you get paid, that's when the seller gets paid, that's when the buyer gets the house. So everything is kind of contingent upon that happening. But you can kind of see there's a lot of moving parts that go into that. And so you just want to make sure that you're asking the right questions so that you know when it's going to fund and record before you tell your buyer or your seller like, oh yeah, you're going to have your money by this day or you're going to be able to move in here that you're aware of this process. Do you guys have any questions on that? Mr. McLeod? So are you saying that settlement and closing are different? Oh, I'm not saying that. 
<laughs> Anyone else have a question? You guys, if you do, we can talk about it more next week. But just just a, something to throw out there so that, um, you know, that's one way that you get referrals. Keep your clients happy. Set your expectations. If you have any more questions, you can locate me on the fourth floor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My job. She's out. What was your name again? Sue. Great. Sue. All right. Jen, did you want to say anything? Just one happiness. Did you bring your daughter? I have promised later. <laughs> happiness. I also work with Jeff over at Citywide. So for those of you who may not know, Citywide is right across the hall from C21. Uh, my name is Jennifer Morris, and I just start off by saying that, for those of you who may not know me. And I'm a marketer over there, so if you have any questions about loan officers, um, anything, you can always come to me and ask me, and I can get you set up with a loan officer who I think would really, you would work well with. You know, not every loan officer works, works well with everyone, but that's kind of my job of what I do. If you have any questions or anything I can help you with. Um, one thing I like to do, I know it gets kind of boring when people stand up here and they talk rates and things like that, so I kind of like to give you a little thing, something pass on my little words of wisdom that I've learned. One of the things I was listening to this morning is Earl Nightingale. Do you guys ever listen to anything in the morning? Anyone listen to Earl Nightingale? Seasoned people, yes. Listen to John this morning. Yeah. Awesome. That's a really good thing. If you guys don't have the daily message for you new, do you guys have the daily message? A great thing to listen to. Seven o'clock comes over every morning. That's the best thing to listen to and kind of get your day started. Um, I'm listening to Earl Nightingale, and actually, I was going to download The Strangest Secret, but then I accidentally downloaded The Strangest Secret, revisited. And it's a little different, and he kind of talks about how he started in the business. And one thing that stuck out this morning, he said, I jotted this down as I was getting ready. He says, um, you are the sum total of your thoughts to this point in your life. Now that could be a scary thing as I was sitting there thinking, I am where I am because of every single thought I've had in my life thus far. You know, and doing, you know, usually people are doing their New Year's goals. We've been doing that at our house a lot, talking about goals and what we want to accomplish this year. And the thought of, I'm like, wow. And so I really started thinking about my whole morning, my thought pattern, because I think I think pretty positively and, and do well, but really when I thought down to it of all of the thoughts that went through my head this morning, they were pretty negative. I'm like, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that. That's kind of how I run my, my thoughts, really. Should have, could have, would have. Instead of like, yeah, I did this. Okay, I'm feeling good about this, just achieving things along the way. So that's my little words of wisdom to you. Um, think about that. Really notice about what you're thinking daily. Be careful of what you're thinking. <coughs> Start your day up with listening to something. It's a great way to get your mind going first thing in the morning. So please come over and visit us. I'd love to help you with anything I can. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you got to clap. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to ask you guys to scoot up a little bit. So now you don't have to like sit right next to each other. You can leave a space in the chairs, but at least scoot up and let's like uh, be uh, you know somewhat close here. Hey, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to go through and be doing uh, business planning today. So, um, you know, every one of you is, is an exceptional person, but, but one of the things you're not an exception to is the rules of success. So as you are doing your business planning and things, it's, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is there are rules to success. There are things that need to take place. Just like if you were going to go out and bake a cake, you've got a recipe that you got to follow, right? What's going to happen if you decided to throw the, the flour into the cake after you cooked it? Probably not going to come out real well, is it, right? So the same thing applies to, to you in terms of your success. And one of the things that is going to lead to your success is having a plan and putting together a business plan. So we're going to go through and, and do that today. The other thing that uh, I've got is I've got a CPA that is going to be here in about an hour. So we've got an hour to get through the, the stuff that I'm going to cover. And then we've got this uh, Curtis uh, that's a CPA is going to be here to talk to you a little bit about in terms of planning that way if some financial things as well. So um, anyway, so as we jump into this Curtis and get Nigren. going, what's that? Uh-huh. Is he your uh, accountant? Is he? All right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, good. 
So he's going to be here. So we're going to jump in and get through that. So here's where I want to start, though. How many of you have read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Most of it. Okay, good. Well, I'm going to test your memories here a little bit, those that have read it. so And those that haven't, will then we'll bring you up to speed, and you'll want to read it. But He's giving a free seminar somewhere in Utah here. Oh, is he? But he Thanks. won't be there. Oh, is that going to be him? Well, it'll be one of his... It's cronies. cronies. Yeah. All right. So he talks about uh, so, so four quadrants. What are the what is the first section of these four quadrants that uh, Robert Kiyosaki talks about? An employee. So, so an employee. Okay. So what what happens as an employee? You work for someone and they make more money than you. So yeah, you are working for somebody else to help them make more money, right? So in this, what happens if you don't show up? Right. If you don't show up you, as an employee, you're not going to have a job. Which actually, by the way, um, oh, I just went blank on the guy's name. I can't think of the guy's name. Ryan. Anyway, what? Ryan. No, it wasn't he. It was, no, this was a uh, business uh, management guy. Can't Steven his or name. Covey? Covey. No, it's before Covey. Started. Cunningham. No. And Napoleon Hill. No. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, 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 this guy, anyway, giving a talk at, I think it was UCLA, he walks up to the podium and basically what he said was that the only reason that most of Americans have a job today is why. Why do you think most people have a job? And I don't, what I don't mean is like because they can't afford to not have a job, but why do people still, why does an employer keep them employed? That's probably the better way of saying it. Show? Number one reason, he said, the number one reason that people have a job today, that, that most Americans still have a job, that they haven't been fired, is because they show up. And if, if you doubt that, what's the number one reason that most people get fired? It's for not showing up, right? So, so as an employee, what happens if you don't show up? You get fired, right? Okay, so what that was section one or quadrant one that he talks about. What's in the next quadrant down here? Do you remember? There's a hundred I'll help you out. Self-employed. Now, what's the difference between being self, being an employee and being self-employed? You're the boss. So, as self-employed, you're the boss. Okay, good. What else? The market pays you as opposed to an employer. Okay, say more about that. What do you mean the market pays you? You have to go to the market and produce profit okay. in order to have money. Okay, good. What happens if you don't show up? No business. You don't make money? It, you don't get fired, right? But yeah. you don't have any money, right? Um, employee, there's a ceiling. If self-employed, there's no ceiling. Okay, good. So as an employee, typically you're going to have kind of a max of somewhere you can go, but as self-employed, we can go as high as we want to, to some extent, right? There, there are some, some downsides to this as well, but we'll get into that in just a minute. But, um, so yeah, so the, the, if you don't show up though, you still aren't gonna get paid, right? Mm -hmm. So the next quadrant, remember what that one is? Business owner. So what's the difference between being self-employed and being a business owner? Business owner owns property and has a number of employees. Okay, so typically they're going to have people working for them, which is these, right? Good. What else? What else is different? What other things does typically a business have that self-employed people don't? A physical Same. place to work. Okay, like could be. System. Could be, although uh, typically the self-employed, you're still going to have... Home. Some place to go, whether it is their house or whatever. What else? They do the hiring and firing. Okay, good. They do the hiring and firing. Good. What else? Responsible for other people. Okay, good. Like it. What else? There's a few other things that they have that a self employed person doesn't have. Now, typically, a business owner typically are they are going to have systems in place meaning if you went out and bought like a subway franchise today they're going to have here's the system here's the structure here's how you're going to do it right so business owners typically the difference between these two is typically a business is going to have 
systems and structures in place, what else is a business going to have that typically a self-employed person doesn't have? Schedules. A business plan. Perfect, yes. Schedules and a business plan, right? Tipi and what we want you to be is not a self-employed agent, we want you to be a business a, a business owner as an agent, right? Which what that means is that you need to also have a business plan. You got to have a uh, schedule that you're going to be following. Meaning, typically the business has set hours, and what happens if if they don't show up and they don't open? They go under. Yeah, they're probably not going to last very long, right? My wife and I have a restaurant that we love to go and eat at. It's one of our favorite places to eat, but. The service there is horrible. In fact, we took the family there last night, walked in, and as we walked in, there's a whole lobby full of people standing there. And so I was trying to figure out like where the line was and things. I walked over to one guy and I said, so are you on the, the list? And he looked at me and he said, I didn't know there was a list. And I, so I looked at these other people, are you on the list? No, there's nobody, there was not, no hostess. Every, all, you had all these people just standing there, no hostess there to do anything with them. Eventually, one of the other waitresses walked up and just said, who's next? And everybody kind of looked around, and, and one person raised their hand finally. They took them back, but no, they <coughs> never showed up. We finally went and sat down, ordered, waited about a half an hour before we even got our drinks. And I mean, but we knew that going in. I mean, we like, it's, we just know, we like the food enough, we're willing to put up with the, the risk of that. My biggest concern, though, is, how long is that business going to stay around if they continue to do that? Probably not very long, right? So same thing with this. In terms of a business owner, you need to have a business plan. You need to have your schedule in place, and you need to be working towards something. Having this, imagine what would happen if, um, I don't know, what's, give me, uh, Apple. Who, what's the guy's name? Is it Tim Steve Cook? Oh. Well, Steve Jobs is dead now, but who, is it Tim Cook that's in charge now? Does that sound right? Anyway. Well, if you guys don't know, then we'll say yes, it is, yeah. right? It's, <laughs> that's who it is. It's Tim, what's that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what would happen if he showed up to their like next meeting and said, had a binder there and just said, you know what, guys? We decided this year we're not going to actually put together a plan. Wing it. We're just going to wing it this year. <laughs> what do you think would happen? Job opening. Yeah, he's not going to last very long, right? But, but now let's look at some of the other advantages, though. In terms of a business owner, if I own a business and I decide that I'm not going to show up to work for the next two weeks for whatever reason, what's going to happen? Or what should happen? A business is going to fall. No, uh, someone as a else business will owner? Be able to if I'm a business it. owner, he, you got he people will have have all your systems. Yeah, I should have things structured and set up in such a way that if I decide to go on a two week vacation or one month, that yes, maybe it doesn't work, operate as efficiently, Carl, but it should be able to continue to run without me being there, right? Mm -hmm. Versus on self employed, if I decide to take a month off, what happens? Then you have to rebuild from the... You're going to have fun. That's right. You're starting all over again, right? Okay, good. So that's the difference here. Now, what's the last quadrant? Entrepreneur. Pretty close. Retired. Oh. <laughs> that should be this. Yes, you're exactly right. Investor. What's the difference between an investor and a business owner? Or a self-employed, even? What's the difference of an investor? He's just putting up the money. Yeah, as an investor, what's happening is you, what you should be doing is put, you're putting your money to work, right? The money is out doing the work for you. Now, what happens if you don't show up with that? Yeah, your money's, you've got these little soldiers that are out there working. So part of why I want to go through and talk about this, for each of you, part of where I want you thinking in terms of your business planning, most real estate agents get to this section right here, this quadrant, and they get stuck there. They just stop. That I'm self-employed. And I don't want you to do that. What I want you to do as we go through and talk about this business planning is to think in terms of a business owner. I'm a business owner, which means I need to have actually a business plan, but along with that business plan, I need to have some structure. I need to be working towards creating something to where I am actually, I mean, for ideally for you, you should be, some of you I know are on teams, right? So ultimately what I want you working towards is becoming that business owner or becoming that team leader to where you are creating something that, where, that if you decide to take some time off, 
they keep working for you so that you keep making some money, right? But along the way with that, we also want you to be thinking about saving, putting some money aside and starting to do some investing. Um, I just was reading, or excuse me, listening to recently, I think it was Jim Rohn that was talking about it, that basically he says you need to have 10% of your income should go to what? Different things. So some charity, some type of a charity thing, okay? So 10% to a charity, 10% to what? Savings. To savings. Now, it, what he talked about though is in terms of your savings, you need, there should be two types. So 10% so should be going to a passive type of a savings. What does that mean? Passive savings. For the future. Okay, good. But Some's in their business. Good, but what else? What, what would passive though? Passive? passive Something that's savings. not going to work for you right well, now. Or passive. Pa when I say passive, and I guess it doesn't have to be savings, you could say it as investing. Passive investing. What would be passive investing? For the long term. Okay. So like stocks or? Yes, yeah, things that you're not having to really do anything with it. You're giving the money basically to somebody else. And, and part of what he talked about is stop and think about it for a minute. In terms of how do banks operate? They take the money that goes in, they reinvest that out, loan it out, all those type of things. So, so part of why you want to be doing that is, one, is to be able to help our economy to continue to operate as it should, is part of it. The other piece of it is you're allowing somebody else <coughs> to take that money and go and invest it and do some things with it, whether it's in stocks or at um, bonds or something like that, right? Then the other 10% is what he called active investing. You need to have 10% that you are investing into active investments. What would the active investments be? Something that's doing something for you right now. For us, SEO stuff. Okay, could be SEO. What? That's working for you now, not later. Okay, good. What else? Rentals. Yeah, see, think of it, think of active, becoming an active investor is meaning you're taking some of the money and you're saying, okay, I'm going to actually be involved in what this is doing. I'm going to take that money and maybe go buy a property and then rehab it and turn around and sell it. The example he used for talking about um, kids is maybe they go buy a wagon and fix it up and then sell that wagon to somebody else for a little bit more money. Same kind of a thing for us. One of the things you may want to be looking at is getting involved in doing some investing in real estate or something like that, where you're getting something, improving upon it, and then turning around and selling it. So, so part of what we want to be doing is we want you to be thinking in terms of long term, I want to become an investor. There. Well, you can listen to me if you want. I filed all my taxes this year and I got a sympathy note from the IRS. So <laughs> <laughs> the little guy with no neck showed up with a list of services I'm now eligible for. But, um, <laughs> but, but uh, but, but I remember Lynn Wardley told me back that old Wardley Homes and Gardens, he said, if you're really going to be in this business, there should be three things that you're doing all the time. One is you're helping buyers and sellers sell and buy. Second, you should be looking for properties that you that show up in your life that are could be a short, like a, a good property, property you could buy and flip immediately. And then the third one is you should be adding real estate to your portfolio at all times. And I did that. You know, I have toilets that I can fix any time I want to. <laughs> I, I have a sewer line that I'm fixing right now from <laughs> outside of the house to the road. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I got enough of those that when they call, I don't even remember who they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but you do want to be, so ultimately though, here's the thing. You should not have to be working as hard at the end of your real estate career as you are at the start. Meaning, at the beginning, yes, you are going to be working hard to get this business up and running. But if you do it right and you are investing and putting money aside and thinking of it in terms of some passive investing, some that you are just buying some stocks or maybe even think of a passive as purchasing a property that is going to be a rental property, but also then taking some money and saying, okay, 10% of my income is going to go towards active investing, finding something that you can do, invest it in, whether it, it could even be, I have an uncle that what he does, he was a dentist, 
but he is now in this category as an investor and what he has done is he actually is the one who is out loaning money to a lot of the builders right now at, that are building so he will they will use his funds to go build the house and then when they sell the house they turn around and pay him so he's making his money off of off of doing those type of things but the point being i want you guys thinking that way of we have the great potential to make a lot of money in this business but in my 20 years of doing this and daryl you you've been probably how long have you longer than me right well my experience level is nothing like this. well but you've been around around for how long Okay, so yeah, so, so what, 26. 26 years, yeah. So 26 years that you, I should know that, that was the year I was married. That's Me bad too. that I was like, I had to stop and think, right? So uh, I'm glad you remembered though then, Julie. So, but um, how many times have you seen agents that don't ever save anything? Yeah, very few agents will take the time to actually do this and become into this category. So, so part of why I'm spending so much time on this is I want you as you start your business plan to be thinking that way and to go through it that way, okay? Now, one other thing that we're gonna go through and then I'm gonna pass out the business plans here and we'll, we'll go through and talk about it. But I wanna go through and talk about, actually let me make sure I'm not forgetting anything first. Yeah, okay. So um, in terms of, of putting together the plan, when you are setting goals, when you're doing goal setting, which, which I didn't intentionally put this class to be like the first class of 2017, it just kind of happened that it fell that way, but it's actually good that it did. So in terms of you putting together a business plan though, so when you're putting together your plan, what's the first thing that you need to do? Decide what you want. Okay, yeah, so the very first thing we've got to do is decide what we want. Once we have decided what we want, what we want to accomplish, those type of things, the, the, the next thing we need to do is write it down. So once we have figured it out, we need to write it down. Why is it important to write it down? So you want to be real, tangible? Yeah, so that it's real, it's tangible. And other, if you don't write it down, what is it? Idea. It's a dream. Yeah, it's an idea, a dream, or a wish, right? It's, it's not necessarily really a goal. It's just something in our head that's going on, right? So the first thing you need to do is make sure it's written down. So I'm going to pass out to you here in just a little bit the business plan, and we're going to go through and talk about it. But number one thing you want to make sure in goal setting is you've got to write it down. Second thing that should, you need to do, what else? Once you have it written down, what's the next step in goal setting? Before that, I, so next thing is identify a timetable. What is your timetable? So when are you going to do it by? You need to put a date on there. So in fact, um, pull out, somebody got a calendar handy? Oh, you got one right there. Sean's got one right here, okay. What I want you to do is on your calendar, so it, it, and you guys can check yours as well. Go to someday. That's right here. Someday. Yeah, where is someday on your calendar? Someday. It doesn't exist, right? Yeah. Someday does not exist on your calendar. It exists all John. through the whole year. Yeah, that's right. So someday doesn't exist. So because of that, we need to identify an exact. So when are you going to do it by? Okay. So in, when we're putting together these goals and plans. Now, let me. I'm going to tell you a quick little story about that. What happened in during World War II in Japan? Hiroshima. Yeah, and what happened? The bomb. Yeah, we dropped a huge bomb on them, right? Totally devastated their, their country, it ended the war. Yeah, two bombs, right? So what happened, though, after that is they made a decision that they wanted to become number one at something. So what they said is we are going to become number one in the production of steel. Now, do you know who was the number one steel producer at that time? United States. We were, right? And so the U.S. was producing all of this steel. Japan decides we want to become number one. So they write it down. They identified the timetable. They said by 1950, they were going to be the number one producer of steel. So they write this down. They identified by 1950, we're going to be number one in producing steel. Now, what's the problem with that in Japan? 
They don't have the natural resources. Yeah, they don't have the resources they need to create steel. Because what is Japan? An it's an island, right? So they don't have the ore that is necessary for them to, to create steel. So, which leads us now to our next step in our goal setting. The number three piece of our goal setting. Number three is, and, and Carl kind of said it, he said um, identify the plan or put together the plan of how we're going to do it, right? So we need to put together the plan. Part of putting together that plan is we need to identify the challenges. What are the challenges to that? So what are the challenges that Japan was facing in terms of create, becoming the number one producer of steel? Well, we don't have iron ore to create steel. So what else do they not have that if, if you're going to have, you have to get that really hot. Steel plants. Yeah, you're gonna, you've got to get that iron ore really hot, right? Coal. You're going to need coal, which they didn't have, so they had to figure out. So they had to identify what are the challenges that we're going to be facing as we put this together. Now, once they've identified the challenges, then they can do the, the next step, which is what? Come up with the solution, right? So that's what, when Carl said put together the plan, part of the plan is we got to come up with the solution. So well, how are we going to do it? Okay. Now, let me show you um, one other piece of this that I like to talk about in terms of goal setting. If I am sitting in a sailboat over here, I'm in a sailboat here. <laughs> Do you like my artistic <laughs> ability, Sean? Just like the runner nuts. <laughs> yeah, you like that? The board what? I was just... The keel. 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 I thought the keel was just the bottom of the boat. But it doesn't matter. Is. That has nothing to do with the business plan. Okay. <laughs> but it does have to do with this. If I'm sitting there in a sailboat and I want to get from point A to point B, but the wind is blowing this direction, can I do it? Yeah. So how do I, what do I have to do, Carl? You have to tack. Okay, I have to do what's called tacking, right? So what tacking looks like is this. I'm going to have to first go this way, then I'm going to go this way, then I can come back this way and I'll get there. Okay. Now. Here's the challenge though, to somebody who doesn't know anything about sailing, if you are not a sailor and you didn't know anything about sailing, and you're sitting here in a sailboat and the wind's blowing this way, what are you going to think? Can't Pull the sail down Can't. and start kicking. Yes, I needed an oar to start rowing, right? You're not going to get there without a motor or an oar is what most people would think because the wind's blowing this way. But in reality, you can do it, you just have to go do what's called tacking, you're going to go like this. You're going to zigzag. Now, what does it look like, though, to somebody who doesn't know anything about it, who's on the shore, and they see you get in your boat and you start out this way, what does it look like? Of course. Yeah, you're going the wrong direction. You turn and head back this way, what does it look like? They're it's never going to make it, right? Yeah, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, next thing we know, here we are. Now, guess what? You, in terms of you and real estate, for, for you that are newer in the business, this is what t prospecting looks like. You go, you go to work, you get on the phone and you start prospecting, you go out and knock on doors, you start prospecting, and you go home from work and your significant other says what to you when you get home? What did you do? How much did you make? Yeah, did you sell a house today? What did you do today? Did you sell a house today? And you say no, but I made 50 contacts. And what does that look like? Did you say, any, well, the next question from that? Did you set any appointments? No, but I made the contacts. Well, then you're still going way up. Yeah, see, it looks like we're off track, right? We come down to here and they say, how many appointments did you set today? Well, I got a few appointments. Did you sell a house? No. But to them, it looks like, well, you're off track. But really, if you'll keep doing those things, you're going to get to where it is you need to go. So in terms of our goal setting, identify the challenges. So when we're sitting here in the sailboat, we're identifying the challenge is the wind's blowing straight in my face. So what's the solution? Well, I need to do something called tacking, which means I'm going to go like this to get there. So here's the interesting thing, though. What would happen in the sailboat, though, if there were no wind at all? If there's no wind at all, I don't have an oar, no and I don't have a motor. There is resistance if there's not air going away. That's right. See, it's interesting that to... To us, what looks like the, the thing that is the challenge, the thing that's keeping us from getting to where it is that we want to go, the wind, 
is actually the, the resistance, like Wanda's saying, it's actually the thing that is going to get us to where we need to go. The challenge is what? We have to identify the solution. How do I harness those forces so that I can use them to my benefit to get me to where I need to go? Because in reality, that's all this is. is the purpose, in fact, the purpose of a goal, the, the whole purpose of writing down and, and setting a goal is to identify the forces that are acting to keep you from getting what it is you wanted. Because if you stop and think about it, if it were easy, if it were easy, what would happen? Everyone would do it. We would just say, okay, I'm going to go make a, a $250,000 this year, and we would just do it. But that's not the way in reality what it is. Instead, what we have to do is say, what are the forces that are acting to keep me from getting what it is that I want, and how do I use those forces to my advantage now to get to where it is, okay? So number four on this is we gotta identify the challenges. What are the forces that are there? That's the whole purpose of a goal. That really, how many of you have heard that in order to be successful you have to have a goal? Of course. Okay, do you believe it? Yes. Okay, so, but here's the flip side of that also means that in order to fail, you also have to have a goal. So what's the difference? So have, me, my point in that is having a goal is not the thing that's going to get you there. Just having the goal and writing it down. It's identifying the timetable, coming up with what are the challenges, what are the things that are stopping me, and then what are the solutions that I can put into place to get me to where I need to go. Does that make sense? Number five then. After we've identified the solutions, what, what's the next thing we got to do? Put it into action. That's right. I'm going to call that massive, take massive action, right? we got to actually go through and do the things that it's talking about, or excuse me, the plan that we have put in place. So we've identified this timetable, we've come up with the challenges, we've come up with here's what the solutions are. Now what we need to do is go to take massive action, or another word for that is called, another word is hard work, right? It's going to take hard work. we got to jump in and go do it. Oh, I forgot one thing. We'll put it as number six, but really it probably should be up above that one. The other thing you need to do is WYIFM. What does that mean? All right, I'll help you out. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? The other thing that part of what you need to identify in terms of these goals and putting this together is what's in it for me? Yeah, well, why do I want to do this? Now, yeah, get your why. So here's the thing. The biggest challenge that I observe in agents as they are doing business planning is that what they end up doing is saying, okay, I want to make $100,000. That's probably the most common number for real estate agents. Have any of you said that? My goal is to make $100,000 this year. Okay, the rest of you are lying. So the, or, or maybe it's bigger, hopefully, right? Yeah. But here's the challenge with that. In terms of that, like, what does it mean? If money was what was gonna motivate you, we would all do it. But it's really, what's that money gonna do for you? What is ha getting that money gonna do for you? Now, part of it, I hope, is where you're thinking is I wanna get towards this end here of becoming an investor in this. But what is it that you're wanting to do with that money, okay? All right, so with that in mind, let me pass out to you here the business plan. Let's Russ, wouldn't there be another step to that? that you did I leave one out? Well, uh, no, I think you didn't, but this is just a thought. Okay. Number seven could be have accountability. Oh, yes. In your goal. I like it. I'll add it. Go ahead. I also worry about the opposite of that. What would happen if you didn't? You know, you start circling around looking for your favorite spot up in the car. <laughs> that is true, right? <laughs> All right. Do you want one or you, you brought yours? Yeah. yeah, I like the accountability. We'll talk about that, actually. Everybody got one? 
Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. I, now, in terms of this, so part of what, part of this, what I want to um, hit on with this is I want to start actually. There's a quote on here from Mike Ferry, so I want to start by I'm going to read this quote to you real quick because I think it's important for you guys to remember. A business plan is a working document that is not set in stone, so it, it, it can change. And he says, it is a document that is always changing, growing, shrinking, and moving in different directions. It needs to be reviewed weekly by the agent, discussed with your spouse and family before activating, and updated quarterly. So why would he say you should be uh, I, um, discussing this with your significant other and family before activating? So that they can be on board with it, and they may have some thoughts on it too. But okay. especially... Like when, uh, when, we, when I first started doing the business, I uh, involved my kids in saying, okay, this, if I reach this goal, you guys, we all get to go to Disneyland. How bad do I go to Disneyland? So if mom's not home to cook dinner tonight, who's going to take on that responsibility mm -hmm. so I can get this done? So you get, the, you get the whole, and if you don't have the significant other, you find a friend or someone that you're really close to, but make sure it's someone that's not going to poo-poo the whole thing. Exactly. I mean, they need to be supportive. Uh, supportive. Yeah. That's real important. Good. The other thing I would add to that, I love everything you said, the, the thing I would add to it is the accountability as well. Right. You know, one of the things that I did with my wife is I had told her, look, my objective every single day is to set an appointment, and I need to set a new appointment every single day. When I walk in the door at night, I need you to ask me, did you set a new appointment today? And if I did, great, let me stay. If I didn't, then I want you to point to the door and say, get out. Now. Yeah, go, leave. And, and she would do that. I would walk in the door and she'd say, did you get an appointment today? And I learned really quickly that I needed to say yes to that. So I made sure that I said yes, okay? No lies. So yeah, it's the accountability as well is part of that. Okay, so um, he says it needs to be a public document, meaning it should be visible to you at all times. It is a reminder of what you have to do as well as a motivator. So part of what this document should be for you is a motivator as well as anything else is to keep you on track, okay? So total commissions earned. Now, before you write anything in, this, in that section, here's what I don't want you to do. What I don't want you to have as a number is a round number. I mean, it's okay if you round it, but, but let's use the example I was talking about before. Most agents will say, I want to make $100,000 this year. Great, but what does that mean? And how did you come up with that number? So here's what you need to do. Before you write in a number there, you need to identify, here's, and I'm not going to be able to give you everything, but I'll give you some ideas. So the first thing that you need to look at is, how much money do I need on a monthly basis to just survive? Meaning to buy groceries, to pay for the light bill, to pay for gas, all of those type of things. Figuring out what, how much money do I need just to get by. Just on a monthly basis, this is the minimum that I need to just live. To buy groceries, um, gas, all those kinds of things. Okay. So once you've figured out what that number is, that's going to be the first step. The next step then is to say, okay, we'll use what Wanda's example. If you want to take the family on a trip to go to Disneyland, how much is it going to cost? Meaning, how much is the airfare going to be to get there? How much is the hotel going to be once you get there? How much are the tickets once you get there? How much are you going to spend on food while you're down there? Uh, what other things are you going to do? Come up with an ex and figure out exactly how much is that going to cost to do. Once you've done that, then you can look at it and say, okay, how much do I have any debts that I want to pay off? If you've got credit cards or anything like that, do I have any debt that I want to pay off? And how much of it do I want to pay off? And, and decide, it, are, is it all of it? Is it a portion of it? What is it, the, the exact amount that you want to pay off on that? Then the next thing would be, are there some things you want to buy? What things do you want to do? Do you want to invest and buy a house this next year, an investment property? How much money are you going to need for that? What, so are you following what I'm saying? But come up with the exact, is there other trips you want to do? Figure out exactly how much it is. Is there a car you want to buy? Whatever it is. But you should be figuring out all of those things, then adding that together. Well, and actually, before let me back up on that. 
if I were to add this all together, but then said, okay, I still want to have 10% to give away to a charity of some sort. I want 10% for some passive investing, and I want 10% for some active investing. Whatever this number added up is, I would need to then divide that by 70% to figure out what 100% now is. So that, that allows the 10% for a charity and 20% and for your investing. Make right? sense? So once you've done that, that's the number you should write in here on total commissions earned. Now notice though, notice for me, the number that I would write in there actually means something because I know I'm gonna be able to feed my family. I know I'm gonna stay warm in the winter. I'm gonna have the gas to get around. I'm gonna have a trip planned. I'm gonna pay off some debt. I'm gonna also do uh, buy a new car or whatever it is. But notice that it actually will mean something to me when I write it down. And the other thing that I'll tell you is it's very unlikely when I add all that up, it's going to come out to equal 100,000, right? So have it be whatever that number is of what your, your plan is to do, okay? So total commissions are, that's what you want to come up with in there. Now, average commission. So the average commission for our company right now is about $6,800. So on that blank line, average commissions, write in 6,800 for you that are newer, so for Sean, for Daryl, for Wanda, you guys that have been in the business a little bit, you should be able to look at, for last year, how much total commissions did you do, and divide that by the number of transactions that you did to get what your average commissions are. So each, each of you, every year going forward, you should be able to know for you what your average commissions are. But if you don't have that, so for a lot of you, just put 6,800, because that's gonna be about what the average is, okay? So total business expenses. On the business expenses, well, now we'll see if, uh, when Curtis gets here, I don't know if he may say something different than what I'm gonna say, which if he does, that's fine. But total expenses, don't write anything on that line, but on the percentage of earned income, put in 20% there. So you should plan for about 20% of your commissions earned to, to be going back into expenses, those type of things, okay? So total closed transactions. So now total closed transactions, what you should be able to do here is take your total commissions earned divided by the average commission of that 6,800 or whatever the number is you put down, and then that should come up with the number of transactions you need to do to make that kind of money. Everybody following me? Did I lose anyone? Okay, good. So that's your total tr closed transactions. Now that you've got that, you have a total number of transactions that you have closed, or that you need to close, then you've got buyers and sellers. So what percentage of that number, so let's just say on here that we came up with total transactions closed of 36, okay? So of those 36 transactions, how many are gonna be buyers and how many are gonna be sellers? Now you'll probably end up being 50-50 is, is kind of where you wanna probably target to be. But as a newer, for the newer agents, you're probably going to be more buyer heavy early on in your career, which is a normal thing to do, is to have, be doing more buyers than sellers. Which, why would that be, by the way? They're easier. It's what? They're easier. Why? <laughs> There's more of them. There's more buyers than there are sellers? Yes. And you agree, Juan? No. Oh, somebody said really? yes. Did I you say yes? Well, well, I agree with there's more buyers, but I don't agree that they're easier. Oh, okay. The transactions. Oh, are I mean, they're easier to like, get them. Yeah, it's easier to pick up a buyer yes, than to sell it. Right. Go knock on an apartment. Yeah. Oh, you're right. So. <laughs> so I would agree with Sean as well. It's it's easier to pick up a buyer than it is to pick up a seller. But why? Why is more that? More competition. Okay, more competition on the seller side. I think maybe, I'll give you the two reasons I think. Number one for me, I think the very best place for you to be picking up listings is your SOI. As a new agent, how does your SOI, two things, how does the SOI feel about you? How do you feel about them? Opinion. What's what? You don't have much of a opinion. Wait, well, well you know, that's one of the first you. problem is do they even know you do real estate? Yeah. That's the first problem. The second one is, they, believe it or not, they're not sure if they trust you yet. And that, so, but, which here's what is funny to me. For whatever reason, <clears throat> a buyer will trust you as a new agent to help them buy a house, but a seller is more hesitant to list their house with you as a newer agent. Why? Experience. 
it's because they want to make sure that the home gets sold and so they, so they, they want some but why would they think you could help them find one and uh, i mean I, I, it's they're probably sellers gonna are more they're desperate gonna from you because you're gonna give them more of your time and attention but for listing a house, I just think they want someone with more experience. Yeah, they, yeah that's right. That's exactly what it is. So, so you've got to build that as part of where I'm going with it, is you're going to have to build that with them. Which, now, I, here's the other thing, though, that I will say is um, I, I, what Sean said I think is true is it's easier, but there are the same number of buyers and sellers in the market at all times. You think so? Yes. Because every house that sells has what? A buyer so and a seller. They're, okay, they're all, so there's they're, more potential buyers then. Um, with apartment, maybe. Rent or go rent. With, I, yeah, the rent. I mean, you <laughs> go to an apartment. They don't want to live there. So, but then why are they? But because their situations. That's right. But I wonder on that on the buyer side, if it's possible that there are people that think they're buyers, <laughs> but then they never actually buy. Oh, no question. Oh, and no. so that's where that that additional amount of buyers could be rolling around. Sure. But those aren't really. Uh, oh, that's what I'm trying to say. They're not really. Buyers. They're not really a buyer, but right. they, they, they think they are. occupy your back seat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but in, so in terms of this, that percentage there, I would say as for the, if you're a newer agent, calculate your percentage to probably be a little more buyer heavy than sellers. But ideally, you're going to want to work towards getting that. Again, it's, it's, this is a maturation in the business. You're typically, and not always, but typically you're going to start out more buyer heavy. Over time, you want to get to where you do more listings than you do buyers. So in fact, Julie, does Justin ever take a buyer out? No. Yeah, I mean, well, no, no, it's a friend. I was going to say, he, he probably does, but it's got to be a friend or a family member or else. Otherwise, he's got somebody else going and doing it. And why would he do it that way? Time for him to solicit. That's right. We're typically going to spend less time on the listing side of a deal than we are on the buyer, meaning you you might go out and show how 40 houses to a buyer or 20 houses to a buyer, which is going to take you how long to go out? Could be 10 hours, could be four or six, something like that. Could be longer, right? How many times have you been on a listing of presentation, Sean, that you stayed at their house for more than four hours? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you. I'm glad the right answer. Right. It's not going to happen. You're typically not going to put as much time. So you'll over time you'll want to grow your business, but early on it's probably going to be more buyer heavy, and that's okay. That's normal. Okay. All right. Total days worked. I would say. I mean, again, I here's an ideal way of doing this. It would be to go through and calculate, figure, look at a calendar, and actually plan out what days am I going to work and what am I not. But if you're not going to do that, then I would say put 240 hours or days worked there, okay? So 240 days worked, and then how many hours per day are you planning to work? Again, you should have a schedule set up that tells you here's how many hours I'm going to work, but probably somewhere between 8 and 10 is what I would say. That's why you shouldn't sit on the front row, Sean. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just joking. So, okay, so prospecting, sources. So the sources of business. One of the other things you need to figure out is what are the sources of business that I'm going to really be working. Now, number one, no matter what, every single one of you on that top line needs to have SOI written there. Everybody's got to have SOI. You got to work your SOI. Eric, what would happen if Brenda didn't work her SOI? She had no business. She would have hardly any business, right? I mean, she probably would get some, but most of everything comes off SOI, right? SOI, SOI has got to. Daryl, would you agree in your 26 years of doing this? That's right. So, well, here's the other problem. And I wish actually Sean was still in here when, as I'm saying this. Here's, because, and I don't know how well he does his SOI. Do you, Wanda? Is he? We all can improve. Let's just put it. Okay. So, but here's the thing that I'll tell you is if all you ever do is for sale by owners and expires, you're going to burn out. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are some. There are a few people that can do it every day over and over and over again, and, and I've watched it for 20 years, but very few. I've watched some people come in and do that and become top two or three agent in the company, and the next year they're out selling cars because they didn't work their SOI. That's the challenge. You, again, it's back to I don't want you working as hard later in your career as you do in the beginning, and the way you do that is build your SOI. So have I said enough on that? They'll take care of you. That's right. 
All right, so outside of that, so outside of the SOI, or if you have a small SOI, the way you're going to grow your SOI is through prospecting other areas. So is it just listed, just sold? Are you getting on just doing cold calls? Are you using cold directory and calling renters to pick up people? Are you um, doing for sale by owners or expireds? It doesn't matter what it is, but you've got to have some sources. So decide what are those sources that you're going to use to generate your business. Put that in there. Okay, total hours prospected. Again, you need to kind of figure out how many hours you're going to be prospecting, but the, the next line over where it says average contacts, oh, let me back up actually. A total hours prospecting. Again, if you come down here to our 12 step summit of success, how many hours should you be doing? Let me have it on there. Well, I guess just the contacts. We've got 150 However contacts. Long it takes to get those. So typically, I, what I would say is you need to plan for about three hours a day is what I would say. Total hours prospected, so three hours a day, or you can put so many per week or whatever. Carl? Okay, if you're calling people and they don't answer, does that count as a contact? Does not count as a contact. Counts as a call, but not a contact. Okay. Go ahead, Mark. Well, when, when uh, actually, if you don't have any appointments, you should be prospecting uh, for the whole day. To be really yes. honestly, you yes. should, because that is your business. That is your and business. And until you get the appointments, you should be prospecting the whole day. Yep. I mean, you take your breaks, but I mean, that should be your total fo focus as your and business training. plan. And training, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yes, you, but no. what I'm saying is, is you know, just, be, just because you've made 30 contacts, and then you go, well, I'm done for the day, and it only took you two hours, you're not done for the day. Exactly. If you, especially if you put in here that you're working eight hours a day, mm -hmm. then what do you do, go to lunch for the rest? No. <laughs> no, that is what happens. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> so good, yes, thank you. So I would say at least three hours a day. Yes, what Wanda's saying is exactly right. It's early on, what else you got to do? You know, you don't. So either, either you're in class here with me or you should be prospecting, right? So average contacts per hour. Now, on that, here's what I'll tell you. If you're using a dialer, so one of the things you can use is there are systems out there that you can use as a dialer where they'll be dialing three numbers for you, and then once it connects with one, it'll pick up for you. Sean, are you working your SOI? Yeah. Okay. So, but if you're using the dialer, you could probably get about 15 contacts per hour. Would you agree with that? With a I dialer? use a dialer. I get more than that. You don't use a dialer in the game? Okay. Well, good. You're exceptional. That's why you're on the front row. Right? All right. So typically, though, but I would say without, you're probably going to be somewhere in the 8 to 10. It's contacts per hour is probably about what it averages out to be, whether you're out knocking on doors or you're calling on the phone or whatever. So, okay? So total contacts. So based on that, what is the total contacts that you're going to do? Again, either daily or you can do it monthly or weekly, however on here. Total doors knocked. How often, you know, how many doors are you going to be knocking on? Those type of things. So again, Carl, back to total doors knocked would be... Uh, <laughs> He's working a deal. Sell, sell. I was going to say something funny. All right, so total doors knocked and then total appointments set. Ultimately, really, that's where you want to get to as to where you're setting a certain number of appointments every day, having that focused on how many appointments per day you're going to set. Okay? Listings, total appo appointments needed. Okay, so let's look at this. Actually, let me back up on the um, total appointments set. And you've probably all seen this before. But let's say you work 240 days, which is what we talked about or up above, right? You're going to work 240 days. If you're going to work 240 days, your objective, and again, as a, as a newer agent, oh, I left out one piece, I remember. Remember when we were talking about why it's harder to get a listing than a buyer? Your skills need to be a little bit better with a listing than they do with a buyer. Again, for whatever reason, they're going to test you a little more. That brings up a question that I've had for a while. We just read... Uh, Stephen R. W. Cutley's uh -huh. book about transparency and trusting, be to trust. completely honest. How does someone who really doesn't have the experience come across to someone who has experience when it's not really true? Your company does. So Some yeah, company. yeah. So what Wanda's saying is right. Part of what you want to do is you're going to rely, you're going to lean on us as the company a little bit. But the other thing that you got to do, how do you come across that way? The very best way to do that is through building value with them. And the way you build value is through what? Ask questions. 
You've got to ask a ton of questions. If you will ask a lot of questions, be on the side of asking the questions, they're going to give, it becomes an open book test. They'll tell you all the answers. They'll tell you everything you need to know <clears throat> so that at the end, they'll feel like this guy knows what he's doing and I can trust him. Which, who was it? Um, I can't remember who it was now. We had an agent that came through during the needs analysis class. I'll really help you with that, which I don't know if you've done that yet or not. But the needs analysis class, I had an agent that had come through that, that he went and sat down and did that with the seller. Basically did the needs analysis. And he said at the end, the seller said to him, now this was his very first listing. And the seller said, so um, how long have you been doing this? And he said, you know, believe it or not, you're our, my very first client. And they laughed at him and just and then moved on. They were like, that's so funny. They didn't believe him. They didn't believe that it was true. But he really was telling them the truth. But because he did it in such a way. So how do you get it? Is you gotta role play, you gotta practice, you gotta practice and practice. Like yesterday, I was I was getting I was filling out the buyer broker agreement, I was filling out the offer, and I was so tempted to tell these people, well the truth is this is the first time I've ever done it. But I I, I didn't. Was I not being honest with them? No. I'm glad you didn't. Ask. Yeah, if they didn't ask, don't, yeah. If they would have asked, then yes, you should have probably told them. But if they didn't ask, then no, you don't need to say this is my first time doing this. Okay. I didn't tell them and they didn't ask. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would think you, you've been gaining experience your whole life. And so to give yourself confidence, realize that you know a lot about life. And you brought that to that. Well, yeah. with my age, I think a lot of people just say, well, he must know everything. He's probably been in the business 30 years. But I'm that's what Eric gets to say, though. Yeah, that's what I get to well, How long have you been in the business? <laughs> Feels like forever. <laughs> yeah. And then ask them a question. Okay. There you go. All right, sorry. I, They're not going to be. No, nope, you're good. Well, how long's forever? I deviated. <laughs> All right, no worries. So uh, back to the listing. So on that, so talk, if you work 240 days, if you set an appointment every single day that you worked, how many appointments would you set? 240. 240. If, if you went on 240, well, let's say only half of them actually you really ended up going on, that'd be 120, okay? If you only got half of those, would be 60, right? Mm -hmm. If And let's just say that you got not... Let's say you didn't even get half. Let's say you only got a third. Only a third really worked out of that is going to be what? 30. 20. 20, right? Half would be 30. Wait, are you saying of the 120 or the 60? Of the 60. 60. Oh, I thought you were talking about Yeah, no, I'm saying if, if you went on 60 and you got contracts signed on them, and I'm just saying worst case scenario, even if they signed a contract and you only got a third of them, is going to be 20 deals, right? 20 times 6,800 is going to be what? Sounds good. Somewhere in that ballpark, right? So a pretty good number. So in terms of your total appointments attended, so I would say to put somewhere in there, if your objective is going to be to get one appointment a day and you realize that half of them are going to probably fall through, then maybe you're going to put in 120. But whatever your number is, set an objective in terms of number of appointments attended and then total taken. Again, maybe say 50% or something. I was just saying a third, just being safe. And then the percentage sold is probably going to be about 75% of those that will actually sell. So one last thing, and then are you ready, Curtis, to rock and roll? Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to finish off one thing here. So give us a few minutes, and we'll be good to go. So um, sphere of influence. Again, I am cannot in, underline this enough times of you guys got to get that going. That is your best kept secret in this business is SOI. Okay, so how many total people are in your SOI as of today? Do you know that number? If you don't, you need to figure it out and get it put in there. Total people in your SOI at the end of the year. So how many by the end of this year, December 31st, how many people are you going to have in there? So how many people will you add between now and the end of the year? Which then gives you the, the total people added, so that will be the difference there. And then I will e email my SOI every, how often should you be emailing them? Quarter. Or every month? Email every month. You should be doing some type of an email every month. I will mail my SOI every quarter. 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 Good. And I'll personally call my SOI every quarter. At least quarter. Good. And I'll post on social networks, blank times per whatever. The key on this one is just keep in mind any posting that you do on social media, 
it needs to be a four to one ratio. Four that have nothing to do with real estate to every one that does. That way you don't come across as the person who that's all they ever put on there. I had, um, I can think of two different people. Um, one is an agent, the other one wasn't. But all they ever posted, the one was a neighbor of mine that she was doing some multi-level marketing thing and that's all she would post about is, contact me and I'll help you save money on your bills and I'll, you know, and it doesn't take long before you just either unfriend them or you scroll right by and don't even look at it, right? So you got to do a four to one ratio on that, okay? So uh, the rest of this stuff, as you go through the next pages, just for the sake of time, I'm going to just highlight real quick. But on mindset, make sure that you're putting down some books that you're reading. Um, on a lot of the chairs today, there was the schedule for the upcoming book club that we're doing here at Union Park. So that could give you some ideas of some books. Um, CDs and things to listen to or podcasts or whatever. Um, you know, Jennifer Morris was up here this morning talking about, tell you about Earl Nightingale, Jim Rohn, uh, Tony Robbins, any of those type of things are great. But the biggest thing I want to hit on this is company meetings and trainings. I will attend the morning ascent blank times per week. So how many times per week will you attend? Did you say zero? Yeah. <laughs> what? It's at eight. I'm on the phone. Oh, all right. So I would say you should be here at least three times a week, Sean. So, <laughs> and I will attend Summit every month. 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 Good. Base camp. I think you ought to be either base camp or sales meeting every week, attending one of those, okay? And then C21 systems training. Uh, I'll complete the new agent training, which would be this peak agent training by and put a, a goal in there for that. Um, skill sets under that one, go through and fill out. Find a role play partner, somebody that you can practice role playing with. So Carl asked, how do I come across as being you know, confident that I'm not new? Role play. The more you can get with somebody and role play, practice those things, learn oh, the nice scripts. Group. What's that? Rick's group in the morning. Yeah, every morning at 7.30 right here. Stephanie's here, huh? Every day. I'm a dog. Almost. Dog. Yep, she is. All right, so and then the last thing that I want to hit on on this, well, a couple things actually, is accountability. So in section 10 there, you need to have somebody that you're accountable to. We already talked a little bit about it, but going back to again, if you're going to the gym and you know somebody's gonna be meeting you there, you're more likely to show up than if you're just going by yourself. Same thing here. When I first started in the business, I had an agent, her name was Shirley Taiwali. Shirley and I, we every morning, we're meeting at 9 a.m., we're role playing, and then at 10 o'clock we were door knocking. We door knocked from 10 until we got 25 contacts. But every day, it's just, if I didn't show up, Shirley was calling me. If I ever tried to get out of going door knocking, Shirley was saying, no, look, that deal's going to be fine. Because we have a tendency to, when we get a deal, it's like Lord of the Rings and my precious. You know, we're all like, what? That's where I am. That's where Carl's at today. My precious. <laughs> right? So we don't, you got to have somebody to hold you accountable to say, it's going to be okay, Carl, which kind of what I did to you today, right? I got to go turn in my earnest money. Should I not be in class? No, be here. So you got to have somebody to like calm you down and go, it'll be okay, Gollum, or Schmeagle, or what was his name? <laughs> the guy that loved the ring. Anyway, oh. all right. And then the last thing on there uh, that I wanted to hit on is the challenges and solutions. Just make sure that you are identifying, like we talked about here, what are the challenges that you're going to face that you can see for you? Is it I'm afraid to get on the phone? What is it? If that's what it is, write it down. And then what can you do to overcome that challenge? And if you need help on some of those things, let me know, okay? All right, so your objective is fill this out and I wanna see it. So get it filled out, let me see it. All right, Curtis, look at that. It's gonna tick to 11.15 in like two seconds. So anyway, we have asked Curtis, it's Nigrin, right? Yeah. He is a CPA and he's, we've asked him to come in and just talk to you a little bit in terms of like what do you need to know business-wise, so I'll give you the floor. All right, good to be here. Appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you guys. I know Sean. <laughs> so I'm kind of, I was thinking that everybody here was fairly new. Is that not correct? Uh, we've got a few veterans. Okay. New. All righty. Most are new. Though. Can I yeah, erase please erase this. Yes. In fact, I'll do it if you want to. What's your last name? He's got cards here if you want. Nigrin? Nigrin. Nigrin, yeah. You don't need one, do you? I'll pass it. I've got his number on my phone. All right.
Friday, well, like I said, I sure appreciate being able to come here and, and uh, talk to you guys a little bit. So the emphasis of what I'm going to talk about um, is uh, what I think is probably the most one of the most important decisions that you guys have to make from a tax standpoint is <clears throat> what type of entity am I going to operate under? And at the, towards, towards the end of my presentation, we'll talk a little bit about um, um, taxes and what can I deduct and a little bit about your cars and automobiles and stuff like that. But um, just a brief introduction. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I work for myself. I've uh, been in practice for um, about 30 years now and uh, started out working at a small firm in, in Murray and worked there for quite a while and got some good experience, a broad-based experience on stuff and <clears throat> decided that I could build out a clientele and decided I could work on my own a little bit better than working with other people. So it's worked out really well. I'm a certified public accountant and uh, do a lot of income taxes. Uh, my focus is, is um, a lot of business. I love business, small business owners, which, would, which all of you real estate agents are small business owners also. You have to look at yourself as a business person, not just, not just a real estate agent, but you are a, a bona fide um, business person. Um, so when you work for yourself as a self-employed individual, you know, if you sell uh, some homes and do some closings during the year, <clears throat> the end of the year, your, your company that you work for is going to prepare a uh, 1099 for you, is that right? You're not going to get a W-2. They're not going to withhold taxes for you. They're going to issue you a, w, a 1099, and those will be coming out this, this month, by the end of this month. So when you get those, those 1099s, you know, when you work for yourself, you have two, two types of taxes that you have to be very aware of. One is, of course, income tax. Everybody knows that one, right? Anybody else know the other tax you have to be worried about when you work for yourself? Did you even know there's another tax? It's called self-employment taxes. LLP. I'm just going to call it SE tax, self-employment tax. And what that is is it's Social Security and Medicare taxes. You know, when you work for somebody, they would withhold those taxes for you on your W-2. You also had income tax, Social Security tax, Medicare tax, and Utah tax that was withheld from your W-2s. So when you work for yourself, you have to pay this, this self-employment tax. Fifteen point three percent. And your income tax can also be 15%, or it can be even higher. Let's hope that it's higher. That means you're making some good money, right? So if you're in the 25% tax bracket and the 15, hey, you're paying almost 40% of tax. That's a lot of money. I've seen some of my clients that have come to me, you know, after the fact, they've had a really great year. Their self-employment tax bill has been $10,000, and their income tax bill is also ten thousand dollars that means they have a twenty thousand dollar tax bill so there's not a lot we can do about income tax other than making sure that you've deducted everything that you can deduct all of your business expenses self-employment taxes yes there's something we can definitely do about that so when you start out working for yourself which which you are The most common way to start out is, a, is as a sole proprietor. And that doesn't really take anything special to do. <clears throat> Maybe just go open up a new bank account, call yourself Sean, the real estate guy, a new bank account. And uh, in doing that, you would have to use your social security number to open that up. And you don't need any special licenses other than your real estate license. Once you've got through that through DOPL, you can become a sole proprietor. At the end of the year, you get a 1099. <clears throat> you deduct off your, your expenses and you pay self-employment taxes on, on your net income, not your gross. Remember, it's always on your net income, not your gross. And that means that you report your gross, deduct off all of your expenses and, and 
the net income that's left over, you pay self-employment taxes on it. So the other thing you can do is to become, become an LLC, a limited liability company. In your guys' situation, you would be a PLLC. P stands for professional. And this, in my mind, is, is kind of a graduation growth process. You know, it's always good to start out very simple, start out as a sole proprietor, graduate to become, to operate as an LLC. But in your situation, as real estate agents, I always advise skipping the sole proprietorship line and going straight to the LLC entity. Now, the LLC, you'll be what's called a uh, hope you can read my scratching, you'll be a single member LLC. What that does, the, the LLC itself does not save you any income taxes at all. It does not save you any self-employment taxes at all either. Um, but what it does is it, it just gives some liability protection to you as agents. And that's really important because you might have a bad deal. You know, I gave this example before that you sell this cute little home to somebody that you think is fantastic. Eventually they move in and start getting sick and find out that somebody was doing some meth in the basement there and you had no idea. Well, they're going to look to you to help them pay for that. So set up an LLC, set up a professional LLC. And then, then this, the third one is To operate as a uh, as a corporation, and again, this is this is a, a growth process. You'll start out here. You'll become a single member LLC. You may stay this single member LLC for a couple of years. You might not. Um, but what what happens here is you as you jump from a single member LLC to a corporation is that when you jump from the LLC to the to the uh, corporation, you're going to be able to do something about your self employment tax bill here. It's not going to go away, but you can probably mitigate it. And that example that I gave you of, of a client that came to me that had a $10,000 self-employment tax bill, the following year it dropped down to about $3,000 when he made the, about the same amount of money. So it's not going to go away entirely, but we can mitigate it somewhat. And the reason why we can mitigate it is that we can make an election with your, with your limited liability company here to be taxed as a corporation. And we make that election through the IRS to become, become taxed as a corporation as a subchapter S corporation. You can start out that way right off the bat if you have grand ideas that, that, uh, that you're going to make a lot of money in your first year of operation. But if you figure that, that you're not going to make a lot of money, I would still stay this single member LLC. And when I say a lot of money, I would probably say if you're going to gross um, 50 to 60 or $70,000 or more, then you are a very good candidate to, to make this election to be taxed as a corporation. Um, if your self-employment tax bill is going to be <coughs> around three or $4,000, I think you should still say stay as a uh, single member LLC. And the reason I say that is because when you do drop, um, make the election to be taxed as a corporation here, you're going to have to become an employee of your business, and then you have to deal with some payroll. Isn't that right, Sean? Isn't that fun, though? Become. <laughs> I like it. Good. What it does is, is like I said, if you are a uh, an, an employee and you pay yourself some wages, you're going to withhold your Social Security and Medicare taxes, but you're only going to have to pay it on those wages. And the wages could be, you know, whatever is reasonable. Everybody, everybody's situation is different. I've seen it go from $1,000 a month to three or $4,000 a month or more, depending on how many closings and stuff like that that you have. So whatever is reasonable, so that can get your self-employment tax bill down from that $10,000 down to around three or four thousand dollars. Your income tax bill will stay stay pretty pretty steady, but we'll be able to do something with, with your uh, with this self-employment tax bill. And 
payroll is, is fairly, fairly simple. People sometimes think, oh no, payroll, that's complicated. Yeah, it does complicate your, your picture somewhat, but, but I have a super easy program that, that works with, with, um, with realtors and works with small business employers um, really well. So it makes it really, really easy. And uh, hopefully it's been easy for you, Sean. <laughs> well. Good. So at the end of the year, you get a W-2 from your from your uh, from your LLC that you use to file your personal tax returns with. And once you are make the election, um, if you stay just a single member LLC, you're going to report everything just on your personal income tax return under the Schedule C, just like you normally would as a sole proprietor. So that's why I say there's no difference between a sole proprietor and a single member LLC as far as taxes are go taxes are concerned or self-employment taxes are concerned. You're, you just report that on your personal income tax return on the Schedule C and uh, the net income, you pay self-employment taxes on that net income. Then the net income that's, that's left over, then you can deduct off your itemized or your standard deduction and your personal exemptions, whatever's left over, then you pay income tax on, on that. So you'll always be paying your self-employment and income tax on that. Whereas if you make the election to be taxed as a corporation here, your, your LLC will file a corporate income tax return. And it'll be able to deduct off all your business expenses, your wages and whatnot. And you'll receive from this, from this uh, S corporation, you'll receive your W-2 and, a, and what's called a K-1, which will show you how much you need to report on your personal tax return. Because the, the PLLC does not pay any income taxes it's it's what's called the pass-through entity so the net income is then passed through under your personal tax return and you pay the income taxes on it. so any questions on that hopefully it's as clear as mud or whatever so to me to me this is a, a good way to go and i like i said i you know you're starting out here at the first of the year if you're just starting out as a as a new realtor for sure set up an llc at the very least, set that one up. Um, if you go through the year and you get to, uh, you know, June or July or something like that, and you think, "Wow, looks like I'm going to make, you know, hundred thousand dollars this year. I better do something about that." We can make an election later in the year to be taxed as a corporation. You don't have to start out that way. Like I said, this is kind of a graduation process. You move from one one area to another, um, but at least get it started, get it set up as the LLC right off the bat. How much does and something like that cost? I can help you out with that. I charge um, $365 to set up the limited liability company. What does that work out to each day, the daily rate? A daily rate? Yeah. What do you mean, daily rate? Well, it's a dollar a day? <laughs> 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 it's a dollar a day. Um, okay. That's what it would cost you in the first year. Then. A year from now, if you set up an LLC, then you have to pay a $15 registration fee to the state. You have to pay that registration fee every year to keep your LLC. So if you do it in the middle of the year, then do you get to do it, uh, claim that, change everything over to, to starting from that year, or do you just only get to do that income for the time that you have set yourself up in that? Technically, the IRS would like you to split it out, but I, I don't. If you set it up later in the year, we just throw everything under the LLC that you've done for the whole year. So the, the other big advantage that, that it'll, happen, it'll happen for you is that when you set up your limited liability company, like I said, I'd be happy to, to help you with that. We just have to go through the Department of Commerce, get it set up. It's, it's, to me, it's fairly simple. I've done it so many times. If you guys go on the, uh, the Department of Commerce website and try to set it up, you'll be going, oh, what do I do here? You might not get it set up correctly, so it's it was a, really easy to have him do it for me. <laughs> it's a good I was investment. Like, okay, okay, and that's it's, what I did. Yeah, it's a good investment. I mean, that out of that three sixty five, two ninety five is my fee. There's a seventy dollar fee, regardless of whether you do it yourself or whether I do it. But you're going to reimburse me two ninety five plus the seventy dollar fee. So three sixty five, you'll get a federal tax ID number with this set up that you can take to the bank and set up your new bank account under that federal tax ID number. 
So the big advantage there is that you're no longer using your social security number. You want to keep your social security number behind the scenes and protected just as much as possible because there's just so much theft and corruption out there in the world, people looking for your social security number. And the other big advantage to that is that you will have a separate bank account set up and it's a lot easier to, to run your new business because you are small business persons out of this spe specifically set up bank account that needs to be set up. And uh, so when you receive your commissions, all your commissions go into this new bank account and out of that you pay yourself into your personal account to pay for your personal expenses like rent or mortgage, groceries or whatever you got to pay out of your personal account. You don't mingle things together. Because one of the big reasons for having the, the LLC is for the liability protection. You want to be protected, meaning that creditors, lawsuits, whatever, cannot pierce this veil and get your personal assets that you're, you're sheltering outside of your business. But if you commingle all your business, personal, paying everything out of the business account, paying all your credit cards and everything out of the business account, you've destroyed your liability protection because so there's no difference between you and the LLC. So you're saying that you open up a business account and then out of that business account, if you want to do your personal stuff, you have that personal account, which is separate. Yes. And, then, and so you transfer that into that and then leave the business stuff and have, like, if you're going to uh, 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 pay for marketing, do all that stuff that has to do with business, that's totally separate. Yes, exactly. Cool. Makes your accounting a lot easier, too, at yeah. the end of the year. And um, so that's, that's a great point. You want to keep things separate. Um, personally, you know, when you set up a new account, they'll give you the option of having a debit card, credit card attached to it. But personally, if you want to use a separate American Express card that you're used to using because you want to build up your points, you can just dedicate that to the business right. and run only business stuff through there. Once in a while, it's, it's tough to be perfect. There'll be some personal stuff there too. But if you keep that at a very minimum, you're going to be you're going to be okay. Um, and even though it has your personal name on it, I'm, I'm not an attorney, but um, you know, you should be okay doing that also. But um, but get it set up. Come to me if you'd like to at the first of the year. Get it set up. Like I said, you you'd start up as a single member LLC. So that means that's the same thing as being a sole proprietor, but you've just got the liability <coughs> protection on top of it. Then, you know. March, April, June, July, you say, hey, this is going great. I better, let's do this S Corporation election. We can do that down the road also. You don't have to make that decision right now that you're going to be going to be a, uh, an S Corp. And I've had, had one uh, a real estate client, he came, he says, hey, let's set this up. Let's make the, the corporate election right off the bat, but let's not do anything until um, July or August with payroll so that I can get things going, get myself set up, get my pipeline full and keep it going so I'm having closing a couple of times a month and we did that and that worked out real well for him. He got off to a good start and he's, he's made that S Corp right off the bat. But I'm not saying that's what everybody should do, but I'm saying everybody should do the LLC right off the bat. So, so on the corporation, can it only be, can it be a single member? Yeah, you're, you, you are going to be a single member LLC, but you're going to make uh, down the road the election to be taxed as a corporation. If you don't make that election, you're just going to be treated for tax purposes as a sole proprietor. You'll just have the LLC as, as your liability shield there. Well, well I, I, get, I, I think I got that answer. The way <laughs> I'm trying to think here. So, but as going from a single member LLC to a corporation, can you just be a one person corporation? Yeah, you would be a one person corporation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So just still be you. You would keep the same bank account. You've got the same tax ID number. You don't have to do anything differently other than make, make that election sometime down the road. Okay. You don't have to make that election right now, but it's just sometime down the road. 
Yes. Are you going to get into a we can deduct this expenses? Yeah. You betcha. We went through that pretty quickly, so we do have about half an hour. So any questions on, on this? Like I said, I'd be happy to help anybody that would like to, to get the LL, their LLC set up. They're fairly simple to do, but you got to make sure that you're clicking the right boxes so you don't get yourself into some trouble down the road. Create some unnecessary expenses and, st and hassle and stuff. But uh, it's a good way to go. Like I said, you can't, you can't mid get away, have that go down to zero. The only way you can get your self-employment tax bill down to zero is if you don't make any money. And nobody wants to do that. So in a way, this this tax bill, we can mitigate it, but in a way, this is kind of a badge of honor, too, that if it gets up there a ways, that means you're doing really well. We like to see that. But uh, if we do the S corporation and you get into some payroll, and that'll take this bill down from $10,000 down to at least about $3,000. And that SE is based on your net, yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. So if your net income is $50,000, and you're, you're either operating as a sole proprietor or, or the single member LLC that has not made the S Corp election, your self-employment tax bill is going to be $7,500. Mm. Just right off of that. And so if you do the S Corp election, we can keep that around $3,000. So there, I've, I've paid for my fee for the whole year in doing that. So. And, and administering the, the, uh, the um, payroll is, is a little bit more expensive. Um, you know, my, my fee for doing all of that usually comes to right around $1,200 per year to administer a payroll. And then doing the, uh, so there is more expenses with the S Corp, but again, if you're gonna save $4,000 in self-employment taxes by just making a simple election, you know, share, share the wealth, so to speak. I've earned my I've earned my keep by helping you to do that. There's no doubt about that. So, um, but either way, whether or not you make the the election to be, be uh, taxed as a single member or a subchapter S corporation, let's yeah let's talk a little bit about about expenses and deduct tax deductions. Probably the biggest one that that all of the real estate agents have is their automobile expenses, and people will often say, "Am I better off?" Leasing or buying? And I'm going to tell you right now, my opinion is do not lease a vehicle. I don't like it. I'm personally very biased against leasing vehicles. Plus, um, they, they put a cap on them of about 10,000 miles per year. And you guys are going to drive a lot more than that, aren't you? A lot more. Um, the IRS does have a... Um, a kind of a, a, a unique situation in that if you get a vehicle that's over or a truck or a SUV of, that's over 6,000 pounds of gross vehicle weight, they will allow you to deduct the first $25,000 of that cost right off the bat. Plus, plus they'll give you some additional uh, bonus depreciation on top of that. If you get a vehicle, just a regular car or a smaller SUV, the most you can deduct in any one year with this bonus depreciation is probably about $12,000. So if you get a big, bigger vehicle, the, big, the trade-off there is more gas expense, but a bigger deduction. A regular vehicle, smaller deduction, more economical to drive, whatever. But um, So you always have the option of, of um, if you lease the car, you can't take those bonus depreciations that I was just talking about. And um, but you can also, uh, you know, in, in keeping track of your mileage, it, it's a, vehicles are, are, will give you the, your biggest deduction out of anything, but they're the most painful to keep track of everything. Because no matter if you take the actual expenses or what's called the standard mileage rate, and they'll give you like 54 cents a mile this year for it, you still have to keep track of all of your expenses on it. Um, so every year, if you do use your vehicle, which, which everyone will use their vehicle, take it in every single year near the end of the year or the beginning of the year, get your car serviced. And um, that way you can compare, here's, here's from my service records, here's the odometer reading at the first of the year, 
Here's the odometer reading at the end of the year so I can verify that I drove 15,000 miles. Because the IRS will not take your word for it. They just won't. No matter how many times you've written in your, in your journal or your mileage log or if you've written in every time you've gotten in the car, beginning mileage, ending mileage, this is where I went, they're just not going to believe your total miles unless you can substantiate it independently. But if you've been that, that uh, discipline to write in all your miles, then they, once you've established how many miles you've driven, then they will accept your logs and whatever you've, you've taken. So somehow keep, keep a mileage log of where you go, who you visit, and what you're doing. It's a pain, but it just, it just needs to be done. Um, so like I said, I, I kind of discourage leasing vehicles. To be honest with you, if you lease or purchase, your lease is going to give you a little bit bigger deduction because the IRS will cap the depreciation on a regular vehicle. But because of that mileage cap, I think you're going to run into a lot of problems with, with leasing a vehicle. So purchase is a lot better. And if you want a bigger vehicle, heavier, then you'll get a, a huge deduction in the first year that it's put into place. So you would recommend getting a bigger vehicle? From a tax standpoint, yeah, I'd say yeah. If you have the choice of getting a, uh, a heavier SUV versus a you know, BMW, go with the heavier SUV. How, how much does it have to weigh? Over 6,000 pounds of gross vehicle. What weight. normal vehicles would weigh that much? Um, I don't know, I have a list of all of them, but, but uh, you know, Chevy Tahoe, Suburban, most of the uh, pickup trucks, F-150, um, Sequoia, Toyota Sequoia. Um, other than that, I don't really know. Okay. So not the small SUV, the middle to the large. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so once you make that, if you purchase something like that, then, then you'll get a, a huge deduction in the first year. Going after that, the years after that, not so much of a big deduction. So that's always the trade-off. But So I mean, it's $25,000, right, the first year? Yeah, you'll get, you'll get what's called a Section 179 deduction of, of $25,000. Does it have to be a new vehicle? No, you knew or used. So if you went out and bought a used vehicle for $30,000, you can deduct $25,000 on, on, on the taxes. Yeah, it'd be prorated a little bit based on your um, overall mileage because we always have to look at your total miles and figure out how much of that was business versus personal. Mm -hmm. So if 80% of your travel during the year was business, then you could take 80% of that $25,000 deduction and 80 percent of the regular depreciation and 80 percent of your 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 gas your repairs maintenance insurance and um, and interest that you pay on the loan so you do have to keep track of everything keep track of all your gas repairs and again pay pay for all of your all of your automobile expenses out of this new business account you're going to set up Go fill up your car, get your, your business credit card out, use that. Um, insurance, pay for it out of that. I know some of you, when you're married, you're, you're bundled with your spouses and stuff like that, but try to do your best to, to split it out a little bit or pay the whole thing out of your business account. And then, then at the end of the year, we do a reconciliation that, okay, my car insurance includes my wife's car or my spouse's car. So mine is X number of dollars, so let's take that off and we won't deduct our, our spouse's insurance either. But, but it's okay to pay for it all out of your business account because you're covering yours and, and that. Uh, also cell phone, um, again, pay for that out of your business account as much as you can. Again, everybody's getting bundled so much. Family, we got, I've got 10, 10 phones on my Verizon card bill but you know try to split it out just as best you can so you're paying your own business expense out of there and people say well what's deductible well it's pretty in my mind uh, the things that are deductible are, are, are pretty obvious I mean if you go to buy some food for for an open house you're thinking is this deductible well, of course it is is my <coughs> education deductible um, is my my licensing deductible yes it is you bet it is and um, 
Um, the only thing is, you know, that if you get into some gray areas, like you say to yourself, well, okay, now I'm a real estate agent. I've really got to upgrade my wardrobe. I need to buy me some new clothes, some new suits, get a better haircut, go to the gym so that I'll look better. Are those things deductible? No, unfortunately, they are not deductible. You cannot Hair deduct and nails clothing. Are deductible? Pardon? <laughs> yeah, they're not deductible. The clothes aren't at all? Although if you get your clothes um, embroidered with the Century 21 logo on them, your shirts or whatever, you That's can deduct the, those. Okay. Just the embroidery or so the, whole, the, the whole thing? <coughs> the cost of your shirt. Yeah. But if it's just a regular oh. suit, you don't have it embroidered, new tie or whatever, dress, dress slacks, unfortunately those are not deductible. So all the dry cleaning and things like that are not? To use for work. That's um, not deductible. That's correct. The only time the dry cleaning would be deductible is if you went on a um, convention, for example, to San Diego to listen to Tony Robbins or whatever, and you wore your regular clothing there, came home, got it, got it dry cleaned, then that could be deductible. But your normal dry cleaning, <coughs> unfortunately, no. What about um, massages for health reasons? <laughs> for health reasons? Not not a business deduction, but uh, yeah. Darn. A good try. <laughs> I heard otherwise. Okay. <laughs> the IRS has said no okay. to those, unfortunately. That could be, if depending on, on your doctor's perspective, that could be a medical deduction for you itemize well, that's what I'm at. your deductions. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's not an ordinary necessary business expense. I mean, if you don't have good circulation <laughs> for diabetes, you can possibly get Exactly. <coughs> that's um, okay. Any other questions? We've kind of gone through this pretty quickly, so. Can you just, uh, you know, figure out how many miles you drove? It, on your vehicle and just deduct what was it 53 cents 54 cents a mile yeah you can do that you have the option of, of taking actual expenses which would entail t um, adding up and tracking all of your your, your gas and repairs and maintenance or you can just take track your miles and take that 54 cents per mile if you if you do the 54 cents per mile you can't deduct the the 25,000 for a vehicle Right. So it's one or the other. Yeah. You have to do one or the other. What's better? And then you're locked into it for the life of the vehicle. Oh, really? Generally speaking, uh, you know, when you, if you got that bigger SUV type vehicle, for sure you're going to take the, the $25,000 in its first year. And then you're locked into actual expenses for the remainder of the time that you're using that vehicle. But if you're just using your uh, a regular car, then, then you you might be better off taking the standard mileage deduction rather than actual expenses. Okay. What do you do, Bruce? Uh, take it to my account. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, you've got to keep track of those miles, and that's why I say it's a good idea to get your car serviced in near the end of the year or the first of the, every single year. Take it in, get a get a lube and oil. So, uh, any other questions? Car cell phone and mileage, that's the only ones um, for deductions? Oh, no. I mean, you'll, you'll have Your office fees. supplies, go to Office Depot. Keep the receipts. Yeah, and you've got your internet at home. Um, How about you know, buying meals? a laptop? Is that a, okay. Yeah, you betcha. You bet. Even though you use it a little bit for, for personal reasons, we're not going to split hairs over that. If you bought a computer that's primarily used for business, then uh, yeah, let's let's deduct the whole thing. Do you have um, to keep a lot of you, on that? Pardon? Do you have to keep receipts on everything? Oh yeah, you bet. Keep keep the receipt on on something like that. Um, most of the time you don't need to keep your little credit card receipts like if you buy gas and stuff like that. No, don't don't worry about that. As long as you've used a credit card, usually your credit card statement would be sufficient, but Okay. Keep so the receipts in case you got to take them back or something like that. But all right. So on that, you can just use the statements then, because I have boxes of receipts, and I want to throw them away. But I use credit cards for everything, so it's all trackable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How long do you keep those receipts, though? 
Um, seven years? Yeah. Uh, well, about five. So five? Five years. So, That's you know, I meals is a receipt. I, I do too, and I'm thinking, <coughs> okay, the shoebox has got to go. Yeah. I mean, you can deduct some meals if it you're taking good, people to, yeah. to lunch or dinner. Potential clients or actual clients taking them lunch or dinner. You can and at the events, right? Pardon? Like at these events? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you bet. If you go to those events, those those are deductible. Also, if you fly to San Diego and and listen to Tony Robbins, those are all deductible. Um, all of the meals for open houses. Um, somebody you, you somebody buys a home through you. You want to buy them a gift. That's that's all deductible. Also, and um, any advertising, fully deductible for you also. So appreciate that. If you have any questions, um, I think you've got my card. I've got some more up here. I'd be happy to, if you want to give me a call, I'm happy to talk to you. I don't charge for the phone call. Um, email, whatever you'd like to do. And let me know if you need some help in setting up the LLC. I'd love to help you with that also. And of course, taxes. Love to help you with those too. But thank you very much. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank, thank you. Chris. Appreciate it. Yeah, you betcha. All right, that's it. Unless you guys have questions, so thanks for being here. Everybody get a card? Sell, 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 yeah. sell. That's right. It says the brother in the back room. <laughs> that's right.